Welcome to the HPC Best Practices webinar series. This series is brought to you by the Ideas Productivity Project, which is part of the Exascale Computing Project of the United States Department of Energy. This series is a collaboration involving the computing facilities at the Argonne, Oak Ridge, and Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratories. I'm Mosley Marcus from Lawrence Berkeley, and I'll be the host for today's webinar, Lab Notebooks for Computational Mathematics, Sciences, and Engineering. The webinar will be presented by Jared O'Neill, Jared is a principal scientific software developer at the Argonne, Ar Argonne National Laboratories and Mathematics and Computer Science Division. He works on computational mathematics and science applications, uh, looking into ways for improving processes to ensure productivity while maintaining scientific rigor. Uh, he has a background in physics and mathematics and was fortunate enough to work as an instrumentation systems engineer at the Parallel Observatory, 2,635 meters or about 8,645 feet, about sea level in the Atacama Desert in Chile, the driest place in the world. And from there, Jared. Oh, another thing. We have issued, uh, sorry, Jared, another thing. So we have um, issued more than 180 tickets for today's webinar. Uh, all attendees have been muted upon entry. Uh, we'll be receiving questions through the Zoom chat and also the Google Doc. I'll paste those addresses for you in a moment. We have asked Jared to have breaks during his presentation so he can respond to the questions. Yes, Jared, please, I'll stop my sharing. Okay. Well, thank you for that introduction, Osni. Uh, can people see my slides now? Yes. Okay, great. All right, so over the next 15 minutes, we are gonna be discussing lab notebooks, the role that they might play in the computational mathematics and sciences and engineering community. And in particular, I'm going to be coming at this uh, from a heavy perspective, leaning on my experience as an ex-experimentalist. Uh, so before I, let's see, it doesn't seem to be advancing. There we go, I got it. So before I start, uh, some acknowledgments. I, a lot of the content that I'm going to be presenting is derived from very interesting conversations that I had with, the many, diff with many different people. Uh, I want to call out first and foremost, Juan Pablo Gerard, who's an ex coworker of mine. Uh, I've had many different interesting conversations with him. And in particular, I learned a lot about him about how human beings generate and manage knowledge. And we'll draw on that a little bit through this, this talk. So I am, I would consider myself to be an ex experimentalist. My uh, formal education was in condensed matter physics, and I worked in exper experimental condensed matter physics labs for I think a little bit more than 10 years. I did then move to Chile, where I worked as an instrumentation and systems engineer at Paranal Observatory with a specialization in adaptive optics. And then uh, after seven years there, I went back to school. Uh, I studied mathematics for a couple of years with an emphasis in computational uh, mathematics as in science. Sciences, and I now am a scientific software developer, primarily focused on applications, but I do do some work that might be more closely related to libraries as well. So one of the things I want to point out is it looks like my career path is all over the place, and that's a, a fair statement, it seems like. There is a common thread to it, which is that I've always been working on scientific instrumentation. That's what I do, and that's what I like. And there's an implication in this, which is that I do consider scientific software to be a scientific instrumentation. I don't consider it to be analogous to scientific instrumentation and hardware. I really do put them on equal footing. So I'm aware that I'm not the only person in this community who holds that point of view, but I'm also aware that there are other people who view their scientific software in a different way. So I wanted to bring that up uh, at the beginning to make sure that you can understand a little bit about where I'm coming from. So why do we wanna talk about lab notebooks, which might be more closely related to experimental sciences? Why does it my point of view as an ex-experimentalist matter. Well, uh, rather than have me try to convince you that this is interesting, I'm gonna allow Carlo Graziani and Catherine Riley, two people who have a lot more experience in computational sciences than I do, try to address that issue. So Carlo is a computational scientist at Argonne and he wrote a very nice blog article called HPC and the Lab Manager. And in that article, he says that scientific HPC is several young fields that on close examination have not really stabilized or optimized their collaborative processes in a manner analogous to that of more mature classical sciences. As a consequence, valuable science is often needlessly lost or left uncollected. I, I think that quote more or less stands on its own. Mm -hmm. um, 
The next quote is from Catherine Riley. She's the director of science at, at ALCF and in a tutorial module that she gave at ATPESC in 2019, she said that practicing the scientific method properly requires good software practices. This is understood in the experimental community. The computational side has had a historic problem with it. As we can see, it's getting better. So first and foremost, what does she mean by good software practices? Well, I, I think we can uh, understand it to be things like getting your code under version control, uh, continuously learning how to write better code, how to design better software, commenting your code, writing documentation, and getting it under testing, among other, other aspects. And when I talk with computational scientists about these good software practices, I oftentimes hear them refer to this as software engineering. And in some cases, I get the sense that um, what they're saying with that is that this is outside of their discipline. This is outside of science. It's really something that other people do. In their daily lives, they might actually carry out some of that work, but that's more because they have to rather than it's, it's really something that they need to do as part of the science. And so I can't disagree with that more strongly. To me, these good software practices are actually good science practices. They're really about establishing good foundational bedrock low level scientific practices. And I believe that the people who are going to be executing the high level science need to take control and ownership of this low level science, because in the end, they're the ones who know what needs to be done at the low level in order to prop up the high level science so that that science is correct, rigorous, and reproducible. And I hope that that's uh, what I just mentioned uh, reflects, is reflecting a little bit what Catherine was uh, ex explaining during that tutorial module. So I've, I've set up this talk with the idea that most of us will have a general gut level understanding of what a lab notebook is. But to make sure that we're all starting on the same foot, I've put up a minimal definition from Howard Canare in his document called Writing a Laboratory Notebook. He says that a goal of keeping a lab notebook is to write with enough detail and clarity that another scientist could pick up the notebook at some time in the future, repeat the work based on the written descriptions, and make the same observations that were originally recorded. If this guideline is followed, even the original author will be able to understand the notes when looking back on them after considerable time has passed. So this is a minimal definition. We get some sense that this is kind of a, I know we might be engaging in sort of recipes or a cookbook. Um, as we go through the rest of this talk, we're gonna to try to grow on this minimal definition so that we see that lab notes are actually richer and can contribute more to our scientific work than what we see it through this minimal definition. So at this point, we've gone through the very basics of this talk. I'll pause for a moment to see if anyone has any uh, comments or questions. I think we're good. Eric. Okay. So the next section that we're gonna be doing is to continue laying the foundational work of uh, building up to discussing and talking about lab notebooks. When I have conversations with many different people about this, I find that this is generally quite useful and necessary. So I will mention that um, this is gonna be a little bit abstract at the beginning, but this talk is going to keep ramping up and up towards more and more concrete content. So please bear with me in that respect. So the first thing that we're gonna talk about is something called DIKUW, that stands for Data Information Knowledge, Understanding and Wisdom. And so these are words that we use every day in colloquial settings. I think we sometimes use these words in wishy-washy ways. Um, we use them differently. And I do believe that sometimes we use them interchangeably. So some of these concepts are gonna be important to trying to, to discuss documentation in lab notebooks. And so we want to try to use this concrete classification scheme to overload that everyday use of these words so that we're understanding each other. And in particular, I want to make sure that we kind of converge on a a general understanding of what we mean by knowledge and what we mean by understanding. So this classification scheme is not mine. It is a fairly well-known scheme. If you search for it on the internet, you'll find a great deal of content. It seems like in the modern day, it's referred to as DIKW as a, and as a pyramid. I don't quite know why they got rid of understanding. I think it's in, uh, quite important and interesting, and I hope to convince you of that as well. So. Like I said, we're gonna focus on knowledge and understanding. Unfortunately, I don't know how to define those very easily. So what we're going to do is walk through an illustrative example and hope that we converge on a general gut level understanding of the, these concepts, what they mean and how they're different. So let's imagine that someone has recorded some data for us in the form of time series data, uh, temperatures, relative humidities and accumulated precipitation. We can go and pour through that data and try to identify facts derived from that data, which we can call information. And I can take that information and use my everyday life experience to try to derive a statement from that information, which is when relative humidity levels are high, 
and the temperature drops substantially, there's an, an increased probability of precipitation. We're imagining that that's what we saw in the data. In the morning, the temperatures were high, the relativity, relative humidity was high. At some point, the temperature dropped and we started to see the precipitation. So hopefully that's, a, when you, if I were to give this statement to you, we would all more or less agree that that sounds reasonable. However, it's not really substantiated and I would refer to this as just speculation. If we were to have someone who has deep understanding of weather prediction of atmospheric science, they have deep understanding of the theoretical background and practical experience with those systems, they might be able to generate the same statement, but they're also going to be able to substantiate that statement because they're going to be able to tell us why they believe it's correct. What's more, because they've got deep understanding, they're going to be able to probably explain to us why it's, they believe it to be correct at different levels of detail and complexity. So what they're going to be able to do is use that understanding to elevate speculation to knowledge. And what we're imagining is that person who has understanding generated this knowledge and has expressed it in such a way that somebody like me can actually digest that and use that in my life. This gives us some idea that knowledge can be shared. A question that I can ask, but I'm not gonna take the time to answer is, can you therefore understand, uh, share understanding? So I have an obligatory Einstein quote, which is any fool can know, the point is to understand. I like this very much for this talk because it seems like his understanding or use of the words knowledge and understanding fit well with what we just talked about on that previous slide. It's also interesting to me because it makes me wonder if I'm going through my life and I'm making different decisions, should I only be making decisions if I actually have understanding of the situation or are there gonna be times where mere knowledge is sufficient? So as an example, I don't need to understand atmospheric science. I just, I just need to have someone who does have understanding generate knowledge like the, the bit of the knowledge that we saw in the previous slide and communicate that to me. And based on my general everyday experience of life, I can use that knowledge to make a good decision. So for instance, to determine whether or not I need to bring an umbrella with me every morning. So this DIKUW is related to a larger subject manager called uh, knowledge management. The reason why we want to bring this up is because we hope that by being aware that knowledge should be managed, by having some basic idea of how we might want to manage uh, our knowledge in a project, that hopefully our scientific work can benefit from knowledge management. And if you think about it a little bit, uh, I think many different areas or aspects of our life can, can benefit from giving some thought to knowledge management. So principally, what we recognize is that as we're working, we're going to be generating knowledge. And so what we want to do is recognize first and foremost that we generated that knowledge. And then we wanna capture and preserve that knowledge so that it doesn't drift off into the ether as my memory fades. And then finally, to get the most use of that knowledge, we probably want to communicate it with other people. We want to share that knowledge. So if you want a concrete example of what knowledge management might look like, you can think of lessons learned. I would argue that the act of deriving lessons learned is nothing more than generating knowledge. And you usually don't just generate those lessons, you also share them with other people. So of these different aspects of knowledge management, obviously the most important is generating the knowledge, but it's also very important to recognize that we generate the knowledge. And my experience seems to tell me that that's actually quite hard. I think that's a skill that we have to develop. The idea is that when we're talking with people, when we're in meetings, when we're brainstorming, we want to have an alarm bell more or less go off in our brain to help us recognize that someone just said something that was effectively knowledge so that we can scribble it down. So question here is, is knowledge communication only about communicating to others? And if we think back to that minimal definition about lab notebooks, hopefully we'll conclude that no, sometimes I wanna communicate knowledge to my future self. So this leads us into documentation at a general level. The idea being that documents are a fantastic way to capture, preserve, and communicate knowledge. We want to share that documentation with people so that hopefully they can build up understanding. So I, I first became aware of this DIKUW and knowledge management probably about 10 years ago when I was working with Juan Pablo at the observatory. Um, we were tasked along with other people of trying to figure out how knowledge was being created at that observatory and how it was being shared across people and how were we using tools at the observatory in order to share that knowledge. Um, and as part of that study and working with Juan Pablo, I started to appreciate how documents can be quite different from each other and how we can try to structure the documentation that we might create and consume. And so this graphic in the center of the slide is one cartoon and example of how we can structure the documentation within the computational sciences world. And I'll refer to this as a documentation hierarchy. 
So at the bottom of this hierarchy, we have uh, documentation and communication in the forms of emails, Slack, ticketing systems such as JIRA, and commit messages. So this is documentation that we're going to be engaging on a daily basis. It's large in the sense that we're going to be producing a lot of documentation potentially. It's also large in the sense that we're going to be uh, recording documentation throughout a great many different tools. And to further characterize this documentation, consider the example where on a Monday morning I come in and I realize that I want, need to debug some software this week and I realize that it's gonna be quite difficult. So when I start out, I start taking very comprehensive notes so that I can avoid uh, duplicating work, getting lost, going in circles, for instance. And uh, by the time I get to Friday afternoon, I finally figured it out and I resolved those bugs. That means that I'm going to have recorded a very large amount of comprehensive notes, which is great. Hopefully that helped me with the debugging. The issue is that those notes are going to be, by nature, somehow dirty or noisy. So, for instance, the notes that I took on a Monday morning aren't probably going to be that useful because I didn't quite know what I was doing. I was grasping at straws trying to figure out how to begin, whereas the notes on a Friday afternoon were probably quite good because I was close to, to resolving the bug. So what that means is when I was going through this process of debugging the software, I probably generated a lot of knowledge. And it's probably in that communication, but it's going to be in a large and dirty uh, amount of notes, which means that I can't really communicate knowledge or expect anyone to pluck knowledge out from that layer of documentation. It's just going to be too overwhelming. So what we can do is every now and then go through that level of documentation, try to figure out what the knowledge is there, pull it out and put it into a higher level of documentation. So, for instance, we can embed that knowledge into issues, pull requests and developer docs. The idea here is that we go up a level in this hierarchy, that's gonna be filtered communication and documentation. It should hopefully be more concise and cleaner. And we can keep going up and up in these levels until finally we get to the level of a, let's say a journal article, which will be likely to be very filtered, should be concise and most definitely should be clean. So this is the sort of the idea. At the bottom of this hierarchy, we have something closer to data. As we move up and up and up, we should get closer and closer to having more high quality and condensed knowledge. So documentation can differ in other ways because some documents are frozen at creation. So emails and commit messages are an example of that. Other documents are living. An example of that would be the developer doc. So when we start on a project, we can write a developer doc based on what we're expecting to happen. But as that project evolves, as people come and go, as our understanding of how we want to work together changes, we should probably keep that developer document up to date so that at any point in time, a developer can go look at it and know that its contents are correct. So one of the things that also helped me um, or that I learned from creating and thinking about this documentation hierarchy in our world is that it really just seems very difficult to do documentation in a distributed and digital world. Okay, so at this point, uh, we finished the foundational work. And again, I'll pause to see if anyone has any questions on DIKUW, knowledge management, or documentation in general. I don't see any. All right. People are quiet today. <laughs> okay, so we're at lab notebooks. Um, some characteriz characterizations, uh, principal and important characterizations are lab notebooks are that they should be used regularly. The idea is if I'm carrying out scientific work regularly, I should be engaging with it uh, at the same pace. Uh, the lab notes that I write should most definitely be comprehensive and they should never be filtered. And this is important. Uh, my experience is that human beings, we tend to believe that we're very good in the moment of knowing what's going to be useful and what won't be useful in the future. But I think we're really quite miserable, miserable at that. And that's why it really is important to try to write down everything uh, and make sure that you're not filtering yourself so that your notes are going to be maximally useful in the future. Lab notes, in my opinion, don't need to be perfect. I'm not going to be writing polished narratives. I don't have to necessarily write in full sentences. Oftentimes, bullet points will do. Um, it's just important that when I, whatever I write down in the notes be uh, correct and unambiguous so that when my future self comes back and tries to read those notes, I'm able to understand correctly what I was trying to express and also when my coworkers try to come and read that, they're able to uh, understand correctly what I was expressing. And lab notebooks are necessarily content that is frozen in creation as well. So hopefully this is sort of a base characterization of how we might want to use lab notebooks. And if you think back to that documentation hierarchy, you should get the, the idea that this firmly roots the lab notebook in that bottom most 
level of the documentation hierarchy. But here's where we can start jumping off and trying to understand lab notes in a more rich environment. So we don't just have to write down what it is that we were doing. I can also try to encode in the notes my motivation, my reasoning, my conclusions, any assumptions or observations that I've made, really more about my thought process. And what we can do by adding this to the lab notes is try to take my mental state at the time that I was executing this science and encode it within the lab notes. This means that my future self can come back, read those notes, and reload that mental state in my brain. So I'm not only understanding what it is that I was doing, but also why it is why I was doing that work. I think that can be a very important aspect of lab notes. So for me, lab notebooks are absolutely a fundamental part of communication as well as rigorous and reproducible science in a lab. Uh, my experience is, and they are commonplace elements of an experimental laboratory, if not a required part of an experimental laboratory. At the observatory, which was operating on a much larger scale with uh, uh, many more different scientific instruments, we didn't have something that looked like a lab notebook. But I would argue that there were a set of tools in places that automated the process of capturing um, lab notes into an observatory-wide lab notebook. So lab notes are a tool for preventing scientific fraud, and they can also be a record of invention, as well as a means to defend yourself against allegations of fraud. So there is this ask for this potential aspect of uh, lab notebook is a legal device if you use that uh, lab notebook in a correct way. So because lab notebooks and lab notes exist at the bottom level of this hierarchy, as we mentioned, they're probably not going to be very good at communicating knowledge. But there's this extra implicit communication that I find very interesting that happens in lab notebooks. So if you have a group of people who are actively engaged with that lab notebook, that means that they're contributing, contributing to it and reading it. They're going to share and they're going to learn from each other. So I might read the lab notebook and see that I really like the way that this per particular person tried to uh, approach or solve a particular problem, or I like the way that they visualize a particular type of data, and I'll probably adapt my way of working to be based on what I learned and liked from them, and vice versa. So there really is this rich co-evolution and growth that can happen through this interaction with the notebook, which I think is a very lovely and interesting aspect of lab notebooks. So starting to get a little bit more concrete, we've got some examples of low level notes that we might be taking. On the left, we have a bad example where I came in on a Monday morning and at 9 a.m. I told you that I was going to be doing a study called ABC. Some 12 hours later, I tell you that it was an amazing success. I've got lots of data. And I told you the results are in some file system called GCE. I didn't take, you, I didn't, uh, take any time to tell you why it was interesting. I didn't give you any hint about where those files are. So you can imagine that if I come back a month later, six months later, these notes aren't really going to be particularly useful. And you can also imagine that we have multiple people acquiring data as part of this study, and all of them are taking notes at only this level, that really we're going to acquire a lot of data, but not have any real clue about how we use that data or how we should use that data responsibly for a scientific study. So what we can try to shoot for is the example on the right, which is hopefully a little bit better. So I came in on that thing Monday at 9. I started uh, continuing work on that study ABC. I wanted to be nice to you, so I told you that if you want to figure out where we left off on study ABC, go and take a look at the notes from July 7. I tell you that my present belief is that if A is happening, then B must also happen. And then I give you a bullet point list of uh, this experiment that I've designed to try to convince myself that that's true or false. At 9.30, I start executing that experiment on Bebop, and I tell you that I'm going to be using a debug version of a binary built with a particular version of Intel based on a clean commit, and I tell you what that hash was. And since we're working on a computer, we can start to leverage some automation here. So what I'm imagining is that I've got a build system that's going to log for me a great many different lab notes associated with configuring a build, executing that build, and potentially testing or, or, or characterizing that binary that I've built. And so what I tell you is if you want to look for those details, just go and read this file called mytest2022.log. So this is important, uh, a great thing for us to try to make this act of writing lab notes easier and less error prone. The next thing I tell you is that there were no errors or warnings admitted as part of that build process. And some of you might think that this is uh, not necessary. If someone wants to know if that happened, they should just go and read the log. And again, that's fair enough. But I believe that this line is doing more than that. The first thing it's trying to, to, to convey to people is that it occurred to me that I should check for warnings. Then it's saying that I actually checked for the warnings, and then it's telling you that there were no warnings. So that little line is actually packing a, 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 quite a punch. This is also a, an example of where you can get this implicit learning. 
So if I were working with someone who's just coming into software development and they read these notes, they might realize that they should be reading the warnings, the compiler warnings, and they might, as a result, adopt this best practice of reviewing their, their, their build output for, for compiler warnings. So then I tell you that I ran the, the script with a particular configuration. I noted the job ID. I tell you what uh, out results were collected and where I put them exactly. And then I tell you that I started analyzing the data. I didn't see a peak around 1.5 MeV, which means that my belief is incorrect. But I tell you that I now believe as a result of executing this experiment, that if A happens, then C must also happen. And you can imagine now where we're just going to cycle through a similar set of notes as we execute this exploratory work. So the question still remains, it sounds like lab notes are good for the experimental sciences, but are they something that we actually need in the computational sciences world? So again, here I'm going to let Carlo do some, uh, some talking for me. I'll remind you that he's a computational scientist at Argonne, and he wrote this uh, Better Scientific Software blog article called HPC in the Lab Manager. I've read this several times. It's a very interesting article. I would recommend that people go and read it. Um, I've also had multiple conversations with Carlo about this topic. And what I've learned from Carlo is that as researchers, career, researchers' careers progress, the problems that they work on become ever more complex and much larger. And what they find is that the previous techniques that they were using on, the, on smaller or simpler uh, uh, projects start to fail as they execute these more advanced studies. What this means is they probably get something like a sick feeling in their stomach, or they get the sense this isn't how science should be done. I believe Carlo put it as he got this sense that he was doing uh, in-flight airplane repair. And what Carlo believes is that when people start to realize that there's this insufficiency in their tooling and their process, that they compensate by inventing processes and tools. And so this has actually happened to Carlo. And when he looked back to see what he had done, he realized that he had reinvented the lab notebook, that that's essentially what was missing. And so when I've recommended this article to people, and they've gotten back and told me that they, that they read it, Anecdotally, what they've told me is that this article really resonates with them, that some of what he's saying here uh, really is something that they've experienced. My experience is slightly different. When I came into computational sciences, I expected certain processes and tools to be there. I either didn't find them or found them to be insufficient, and I've been working over the last five years to try to effect effectively invent those processes for myself. So we mentioned that not all documents are alike. Um, well, not all lab notebooks are alike either. So if we were to go to an experimental lab, you might find that there's a dedicated lab notebook for each instrument in that lab. The idea being that you would record all work done on that instrument in a dedicated book. So that could be, for instance, designing, improving, maintaining that instrument, uh, characterizing and configuring it. And you might also find lab notebooks that are dedicated to recording the acquisition of data with those instruments. In other words, really uh, uh, recording the experimental and scientific work that's being done with those instruments. Uh, when I worked at the observatory, I came across a different type of lab notebook that I would call a filtered lab notebook. And I've tried to uh, put this notion of filtered lab notebooks to use in my computational sciences world. Um, because these are filtered, these lab notes are gonna be a, sort of a level two or two higher up on that hierarchy of documentation. So here's an actual example of me trying to use a filtered lab notebook. This is a PR that I created uh, for a piece of software that I work on called FlashX. The idea is that I had done amount of, a large amount of work on this branch. I wanted to bring it to the main. I did my own code review. And before I wanted to ask anyone else to do a code review, I wanted to do my own verification to make sure that I hadn't broken anything and all the software that I added was correct. So I did this verification work over, I think, two days, well, about two days worth of effort over about a week, uh, a week's time. Um, so you can imagine if I were taking comprehensive notes, those would have been really uh, quite large. And so rather than dump that in here, I decided to be nice to the code reviewers and I put in this filtered version. So hopefully this is nice in two ways. One is that when I ask people to review code, I understand that I'm asking them for help and I wanna make it as easy as possible for them to help me. So I want to include the verification work that I did so that they can see what's already been done. And this can try to prime their brains to understand how they can carry out this code review hopefully quickly and, and well. And then the other thing is I didn't try to hit them with those full comprehensive notes. I tried to put something that's actually digestible for them so that it's actually meaningful and useful and productive rather than counterproductive. So when I, when I started writing this, I didn't just start off with nothing. I went back to some other PRs that I'd written I plucked out the bits um, from other verifications that I'd done, and I sort of stuck them together into a Frankenstein uh, 
uh, list of, of actions to carry out. And I sort of tweaked those to get them into the bare skeleton that I wanted to start off with. So to me, this is interesting because that's me getting value out of previous notes. And that's me starting to sort of converge onto this quasi procedure that I can use for doing software verification in Flash X. Um, I actually asked a senior uh, person in the, in, in the Flash X world to review this, someone who has more, exper more experience than, than me. I, I like that I put this there not only to help them, but also because it allows them to sort of peer into my brain a little bit so he can see whether or not what I expect to be uh, sufficient software verification, he can judge whether or not it is sufficient. If he doesn't think that's the case, then he can give me some feedback or he can offer suggestions about other verification that I can do. I can also imagine that if there were a junior reviewer on this PR, that it might be nice for them to be exposed to see in to some level of detail how it is that other people think software verification can be done. So for me, this style of filtered lab notebooks at the level of a PR is sort of a win-win-win situation. The reality of lab notebooks is that no one likes uh, writing lab notebooks. I think in general, people don't like writing documentation. Um, so I put up a fictitious statement here that lab notes are a waste of time. I write notes, but never use them. Um, so certainly I've heard statements like this in talking with people. I'm, 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 I imagine that I'm guilty of having said the same thing when I was starting out in the experimental sciences. I think the reason that might, people might come up with this conclusion is first and foremost due to a lack of experience and awareness. So for instance, people might not know that there's this rich implicit communication and sharing and growth that can happen through lab notebooks. And people might not realize that you can turn lab notebooks into procedures. And that's what I was getting at a little bit with that, uh, that PR example, where I have these repeated actions that I'm, uh, uh, that, I, that I'm executing, and I can pluck those out and put those into a nice, clean, mature procedure that I can just simply execute in the future with less thought and effort. Another uh, reason that I can uh, sort of counter this argument is that lab notes only become useful as time passes. If I've only been writing lab notes for you know, a month's time, it's completely reasonable that I have no reason to go back and read those notes. More or less everything that I've written down is probably still in my memory. But obviously our memories fade and you can appreciate that after some years have gone by, being able to go back and read comprehensive notes can be very useful. And finally, I'll add that reading lab notes, but uh, I'm sorry, writing lab notes, but not reading them is actually a good thing. One of the main important uses of lab notes is to help you out when things have gone horribly and catastrophically wrong. There, there is a backup. So the fact that you're not reading them is just an indication that things are hopefully going quite well for you. And hopefully the act of writing those lab notes is, is helping you achieve that. So my personal opinion is that nothing's gonna be good old pen and paper. I think it's just lovely and easiest. Um, there's this nature article that I've cited where they more or less say the same thing. Uh, the sad reality for us is that I don't believe that old pen and paper is going to work. I think we have to use digital lab notebooks. So rather than just jump in and talk about those, I wanna take a minute to try to explain why I think that pen and paper is good and what the difficulties are with an electronic solution. So the main thing is that pen and paper is for most people, really quite easy to use and can be used in almost any situation. That means I can concentrate on the work at hand rather than worrying about some tooling or anything like that. Another thing that I like about pen and paper is that it just presents me with a bank, blank sheet of paper. That means it's wide open in terms of format. I can be as creative as I want to, to accomplish writing the notes in the most productive way. Uh, a counter example of that is if someone's created a template more or less that I should be writing notes in with, I just fill in date in different fields, Someone else has already figured out the structure of my notes, and I'm probably going to just turn off my brain and my creativity and just as sort of a zombie fill in these data and not necessarily know that there might be or realize that there's a better way to be taking those notes. Um, for me personally, I like the act of uh, taking notes because it slows me down in a very nice way. When I actually write down my thoughts from what I'm doing and carrying out in terms of actions, that oftentimes helps me uh, identify errors. Uh, before I actually commit those errors. It also helps me identify subtleties and appreciate those subtleties, where if I, whereas if I was working faster, I might not actually notice, notice that those subtleties exist. And a final point about the good old pen and paper is that these notebooks are actually stored publicly next to where they're used, which means that other people can come and read them and other people can provide oversight to the work that I've done. So the difficulties with an electronic solution, these are mostly taken from that Nature article. So one is that they're tied to technology that can fail. 
Another principal point that they make is that there are a huge number of solutions out there, all with different pros and cons. So it can be overwhelming trying to figure out which tool is right for you. And I think the reality of, of our work is that uh, there probably isn't one tool that's going to work for everyone. Rather, you need to go through and study for your particular project and your particular team which tool will work for you if you decide to go down this route. Uh, a, a very important point for me is that there's a lot of uncertainty associated with digital tools. Uh, so for instance, I might pick a tool that's great one year for my project, but as that tool continues to be developed, it might drift away and no longer really suit the needs of my project. It can also be that that tool's price can suddenly go up. And if I do need to choose from, change from one tool to the other, do I have the ability to export notes from the old tool into the new tool if that's something that I need to do? So lab notebooks, what would they look like for us? Well, paper won't work, as I mentioned. We can work anywhere, anytime in a distributed way that, you know, it's more or less a farce to think that we would be able to, to sit down and work through a, single, a, a physical lab notebook. Uh, when I talk to computational scientists, I do get the sense that many of them are taking notes. I don't know if they rise quite to the level of lab notes necessarily, but at least they're taking notes. But oftentimes those notes are private. In fact, their coworkers and their collaborators might not even know that those notes exist. So is that acceptable for us or should our notes be public as they are in other scientific areas? And if they should be public, how should we do that? So we talked a little bit about how there can be different lab notebooks in an experimental environment. Are we going to have a similar situation in the computational sciences world? So my experience is that it's probably even more so in that way. I'm going to say that we have multiple different streams of lab notes that we need to capture. And as we go through the rest of this talk, I'm going to try to give some example of what those streams might be. Um, if we've got these multiple streams of lab notebooks, how, not lab notes, how are we going to capture them? Are we going to try to force them into a single electronic lab notebook, or are we going to try to distribute those streams across a suite of tools? So after about a year of working on this, I settled on using Microsoft OneNote. If you go back and you read that Nature article or you search online, you'll see that that seems to be a fairly popular solution for many different people. It just seems to be the closest to pen and paper. But over time, I started to realize that trying to force all of those streams into a single tool was not quite right. I want to try to choose the right tool for the job and I want to try to mate each lab stream uh, to a particular tool that's well suited for it. Uh, and again, we're gonna talk about that as we move forward in this talk to some concrete example. And we are online, this is digital, so obviously we should try to uh, leverage automation as much as possible. So how can we do that to overcome difficulties, to decrease tedium, to increase productivity and happiness uh, so at this point now, I think we've gone through really lab notes for CSME. Uh, the rest of the talk is going to be concrete examples. Uh, so I'll pause here as well to see if there are any questions yet. There are three questions. Would you like okay. to take them all? <laughs> sure. Let's, okay, so how do you manage your digital lab notebooks so that they can satisfy the legal requirements you mentioned? Uh, okay. Well, so I'm, blockchain would be one. Oh, go ahead. Blockchain would be one option, but it's probably overkill. Do publicly hosted DDS function appropriately? So unfortunately, I've never had to use or use a lab notebook in a, in a legal sense. So I, I'm not uh, in any way in a position to try to answer that. Um, I do know that different institutions uh, have different rules about lab notebooks. So I would imagine that the best starting point would be to talk with the, the different people in your institution to see how they want people to use lab notebooks, how they're stored and how they're regulated. And if you do want to use a lab notebook in a legal way to see if they're able to help you guide uh, that process to make the best decision. I, unfortunately, I can't, I can't say any more than that. Sorry. There are the other question, it's a long question, but let's see, I'll condense it. What is the best way to make corrections in a, in a notebook? Should you cross well, out the mistake? Should we cross out the mistakes or, or uh, make annotations? Well, that, that goes back to, I mean, that's a great question. That goes back to sort of the original characterization. The idea is that lab notes are frozen at creation. And you, by going back and, and crossing something out or saying that something's wrong, that's something like filtering those notes. And because you want this to be a comprehensive and transparent record of the work that you've done, you really want to make sure that you're doing that in a minimal sense. So if you want to cross something out, if you wrote something, the, 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 the 
rule of thumb that I was, I was taught was that you just draw a single line through it. So it's clear that it's not correct, but if someone wants to go back and read it, they should still be able to read it. So that's in a paper notebook. Uh, in a digital sense, this starts to become much more difficult. Um, how would you cross that out in a digital sense? Um, if you're using, for instance, version control, can version control be used in a similar way so that you really do have your content frozen at creation, um, but still have traceability so that you have, as well, that you, as well you have that transparency? I hope that answers that question. Uh, last question uh, for now. Uh, uh, I feel like some of this filtering or summary of noisy you no, know, it will become the remit of AI. AI tools like ChatGPT. Any thoughts? I didn't hear the beginning of that. Uh, I feel like some of this filtering oh, or okay. summary of, of noisy notes will become the remit of AI. AI tools, what do you think? Uh, well, that's a great question. Um, my knee-jerk reaction is, hopefully I, I, I tried to get this across, that what's really good about lab notebooks, really the most, the main use for it is capturing human thought. I'm not just keeping the sort of written record of this recipe that I execute, but really getting my frame of mind in there. Filtering is part of that. So me going back and rereading those comprehensive notes, trying to figure out where the knowledge is, trying to evolve my understanding from that original day when I wrote the notes is an important process. That's valuable for me at the very least. And I like the idea that as I go higher and higher and higher up this, uh, this hierarchy, that again, it's a human being encoding their thought process. Um, I can see though where AI might be very interested in terms of, of guiding that and you know potentially, you know, this might be just a personal bias that's getting in the way. Maybe, maybe AI doing some of that filtering could be just as good as a human being. I just wanted to emphasize that there is this notion that really what we are trying to do is knowledge management, right? Capture what we do and how we grow with the idea of, of generating understanding. So hopefully that answered that question as well. That was okay. a great question. Go okay. Go ahead, please. Continue, please. Okay. So, I mentioned that uh, we probably don't want one tool for the job. We won't, don't want to try to force ourselves to record all the notes in a single tool. So for instance, we don't want to do a classical thing like have a, a 10,000 line readme. We really want the right tool for the job. And I also mentioned that we're probably going to have multiple different streams of notes. So some examples of what those streams might look like in our world is to, to record a stream of notes for changes made to the scientific instrumentation. In this case, our software. So that could be uh, changes made to the code in our code repo, that can be changes made to the software environments that we're going to be executing in, that can be changes made to our job files or our build system. If we're using our own analysis tools, then we probably want to have a stream of notes dedicated to how we improve and change those. And finally, we want to have as well at least a, a stream of lab notebooks dedicated to detailing how we design our experiment and how we executed it. So here's an example of what uh, a, a stream of notes might look like for recording changes made to our software. So in analogy to an experimental laboratory, I'd like to keep these notes as close to the instrument as possible. And to do that, I'm gonna be using git commit messages. So what I put here is an actual git commit message that I wrote for FlashX. Um, this structure, I, I'm, I'm tending to like this. The top par paragraph is fairly normal, I think, for a git commit message. I'm going to be putting into their motivation, reasoning, consequences, assumptions. If I'm changing or adding requirements, I might, I might document some of that in that paragraph. Uh, basically, what I want to do, do here is put everything in writing, but I cannot reasonably expect someone to reverse engineer out of the commit diff. Another way to think about this is that this is me dumping my mental state into this git commit into my lab notes. Um, the next paragraph is probably a little bit new for some people. Here, what I'm going to do is write down the efforts that I took to verify that the changes that I made at this commit are correct. So I tell you that I ran some 1D, 2D, and 3D simulations on a particular machine with a particular compiler. I had to do some manual verification, I believe, and I tell you how I, 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 can, I confirmed that these changes were correct based on that testing. 
So what I like about this is when I do my own code review for my PR, one of the first things I can do is come back and reread these git commit messages. That's going to allow me to reload my mental state into my brain. It helps me get sort of the high level overview of the work that I did there. It also gives me an idea of what ver verification work was done and therefore helps me determine what, what, what verification work needs to be done. So we've also seen another example of trying to document changes to our instrument, which was that pull request example with the filtered lab notebook. There, what we're trying to do is use the pull request to capture some final verification stream. So readmes, again, we don't want some massive 10,000 line monolithic readme, but they have their place. I oftentimes use readmes in Markdown. One of the ways I like to use them is to, to, to document the high level roadmap for my work. That include, can include motivation, documenting decisions, assumptions, observations, conclusions. Uh, so hopefully you get the idea that this is going to be some sort of concise living document that functions as an executive summary. As such, this is going to live a little bit higher up on that documentation higher. So it's probably not really strictly lab notes, but it's complementary and I think important to raise uh, in this talk. Um, the idea could be here that, you know, at the highest level of uh, you know, where I'm storing my, my results for the study, my notes, I can have this read me so that people can come in and immediately get an idea of what we wanted to do with the study and what we did. If I'm executing a study that has multiple different phases, we can also imagine having a high level roadmap for each of those phases. So I also do use low level uh, readmes for managing things such as uh, software stack. So for instance, if I have, if I'm working in a testing environment and I'm managing the software stack there, I can go ahead and keep track of all of the changes I've made there and why. So that's great because it gives me traceability of the software environment and therefore traceability of the verification process of my software. And as before, oftentimes I will find that I'm repeating certain actions, which identifies that there are probably procedures that should be pulled out of those notes so that working uh, with that software environment can become easier and more productive. So here's a, a simple uh, example of something that I imagined a high level readme might be. At the very top, I just have some sentences. It really is the executive summary about what I want to be doing. I can put in information about the goals of the study. So for instance, our motivation is X. We believe that Y, we intend to use our software for Z. Um, we can put in, for instance, we understand that our software is limited in certain ways and therefore our study is limited in another sense. Let's see. So here's an actual example of some low level markdown readmes that I, I have kept for a test system that I was working on. So some of our tests relied on using the AMRX library. So here I, I, I keep a, a build history of the libraries that we've used. So I tell you what date different builds were done, what branch, what commit. At the bottom case, you'll see that I, I pointed out that some of those changes or uh, that that library was built off some modifications. And I tell you what was modified. And I also give you some idea of why I believe that that library build was successful. So data by itself is generally not useful. We want to actually record alongside of the data, the context uh, uh, that explains how we acquired that data and why. And that can include metadata, of course, as well. So this is an area where we can try to uh, leverage automation as much as possible, I believe. And I, I know that some people already do this quite a bit. So for instance, when you create a data file, you can automatically uh, place into the header information such as build dates, who the user was that acquired that data, what system they used, hashes associated with a different software that was involved with acquiring that data, configuration information. So we have these nice automatically created files that are self-documenting. In terms of our build environment and our execution environment, we can also have as the previous example that I gave, we can build up our systems so that they do a lot of logging for us. So this can include, for instance, logging the software environment. So we're using modules, log that information. If we're using binaries, we can run that binary through LDD to figure out how our external dependencies are gonna be satisfied. We can record git diffs. And if we're using environment variables, we can go ahead and, and print out what the values of those environment variables are. So I'm going to switch over here for a minute to an example of a Jupyter notebook that I built up for a tutorial. I'll give you the note for the, or I'll say the link for the repository that has this example as well as some of the examples that we've gone through as well. So this is uh, a Jupyter notebook uh, as rendered through GitHub. So at the top here, I have a markdown section where I'm putting in at the top, I like to put in the intent. What is this notebook about? Why am I creating it? What do I hope to, to achieve with it? If you're coming back and, and reading this, you know, how should you interact with it? How should you, you know, what expectations can you have of it? Uh, 
Um, this is for, I'm imagining a phase two study. So I put some information about the design. It's a work in progress. So I put current results, current conclusions, and some to do's to remind myself uh, where I left off. So at this point, you look at this, this is really a high level roadmap. This should be that concise living document that we talked about uh, with respect to the README so that this can to some degree uh, replace that type of a document if you want to. Then in the next cell, the first cell I go through and I do some automatic logging of setting up the notebook. So I tell you when I started the execution of the notebook, I've got two environment variables. So I go ahead and I print out the values of those. I tell you what version of Python and which Python I'm using. And then I, I ask Pip to go ahead and print out its information so we can get an idea of how that Python was, was fully set up. And now I have my own Python package that I'm loading and using called my tool. And I've written that so that it has some automatic unit testing in it. So I went ahead and ran those unit tests and we can see that there were seven tests that were ran and they were all successful, which is I'm, I'm very happy about. And now here we get to another markdown section where I'm really going to be doing more low level uh, lab notes like we saw in that first example. So I'm telling you that I'm working on Bebop on such a date, I'm building in such a way with such tools. I've, I've got a, a pointer to a build log. I've ran four jobs with their IDs. I tell you what some of the output is and some of the sanity checking that I did to confirm that those jobs were run correctly. And then I'm able to load some of that data and do a first visualization of of uh, tables in terms of summary statistics. I can see what I can see there. I decide to go back and dig into that data a little bit more through some graphical visualization. I actually ran some linear least squares on this and I chose to annotate the results of that fit onto the, the graph itself. And then below that, I put down in markdown uh, what it is what, that I see in the data, what I like, what I don't like. Uh, did this answer questions or raise any new questions? Uh, things like that. So really capturing my mental state and my thought process. And here I'm just doing some quick and dirty exploration. And then I end by, by telling you at what time the analysis finished running. Okay, so hopefully people can see the slides again. Um, what's interesting about that Jupyter Notebook I'm gonna point out is that it doesn't really fit into that hierarchy very well. It's got components from different levels in the hierarchy. So it really is quite a rich document. And I wonder if that's why it can be uh, so effective in many different cases. So hopefully now we've gotten some concrete examples of what different labs, uh, streams of lab notes, notes might look like in our world. We've got some idea of how to try to pair those streams with the appropriate tool. So are there some overarching rules that we can think about when we try to bring all of that together to build up sort of a virtual laboratory notebook? So, in my mind, we want it to be e as easy to create and maintain the lab notes as possible so that we can concentrate more on executing the science and less on documenting it. Um, since we're taking the time to record all of this, as we probably should, we want to make sure that it's actually reasonably easy to find. That doesn't mean that it has to be ridiculously easy for, for people to find. It's okay if, if certain aspects are hard to be found, but we want to make sure that people are going to be able to do that with a reasonable amount of effort and to do so successfully. If we're going to have multiple streams, but we probably want each stream to have a very clear and simple identity for what it's going to record. And we want those streams to be disjoint in a sense that any single note that I want to write should go into one and only one stream. And hopefully it should be fairly obvious in which stream it should be recorded. And as I mentioned sort of over and over, we want to choose the right tool for the job. So what this means to me is that unfortunately we're not in the nicer world of an experimental laboratory. We're having one or two paper physical notebooks is completely sufficient. We're in this distributed digital world where things are more difficult. And I think we have to talk to, in order to manage that difficulty, to make things easy and effective, really try to be thoughtful and come up with a documentation scheme. And what I generally do is rather than try to come up with that scheme in a vacuum, I try to integrate it into a larger concept that I would call a virtual, virtual computational laboratory environment or more generally an execution environment. This is sort of a world, a virtual world that I'm setting up in which I'm going to be executing that science. And I want to try to make sure that the correct and adequate documentation is part of that laboratory environment that I'm setting up. So unfortunately, I don't have any time to talk about those laboratory environments. I provided on this slide some links to related information. So I generated this content based on uh, two tutorials I gave this summer at APESC. So the top link is a link to a, a video about lab notebooks. 
If you like that DIKUW and that knowledge management uh, stuff, I, I dig into it a little bit more in that talk and I give some perhaps more interesting examples. Um, this notion of an execution environment or a laboratory environment, I discussed that in a tutorial module in the second link along with uh, Anshu Dubey. And the, the, the term there that says example repo, that points to the GitHub repo that houses, for instance, that Jupyter notebook that we saw. So I'm not the only person who is working on these things uh, that I, I like to call execution environments. So I know that there was a 2018 Better Scientific Software fellow named Ivo Jimenez who was working on a tool called Popper. Um, in my mind, that would be similar to what I'm thinking about in terms of execution environments. Um, and there's a link there to a talk that he gave in this very same webinar series. And if I remember correctly, he actually starts out his talk by pointing out that a lot of the difficulties that we have is the fact that we do not have lab notebooks. Um, Aaron Leitner is a student at George Washington University who's built up an execution environment that I call uh, that he calls FlashKit that allows him to uh, carry out and execute his science using the FlashX software. And I've been recently made aware of uh, some other tools that are out there called Code Ocean. And for the machine learning community, you have something like weights and biases. Um, so here's some citations to the content in this, this uh, talk. And I'm just going to leave up here some of my very general uh, and hopefully obvious conclusions. And I'll thank you all for your time and your attention. I really appreciate it. And um, I'll take any more questions that you might have or comments. Thank you. Thank you, Jared. Yes, we have some questions here. So let's see here. Um, uh, going back to the, uh, where are these, in quotes, reading me notes kept by you currently? Going back in some slides. Can you say that again? Where are these read me, in quotes, notes kept by you currently? Oh, that's a great question. So that gets a little bit to this notion of the laboratory environment. Um, so what I do is for each study, I want to create this virtual, virtual laboratory environment. It's sort of this encapsulation of everything I plan to do and actually do carry out. And what I generally do is place each one of those environments in its own Git repo. So the idea is that as I create different documentation, uh, different scripts, for instance, tooling, uh, readme files, and Jupyter notebooks, I commit those into the repository. The data that I'm creating, I don't use huge data sets, but they're large enough, and they're not really versioned, so I don't actually include those in the repo. I put those uh, alongside the, the, the context, the metadata that is in the repo. I put them in there in, in the form of a particular clone of that repo. So that is, I think, a, a very good question. It's a very interesting question. And that's related to this notion of building up a documentation scheme. It's not just about what you're going to write and where you're going to write it, but how are you going to organize that so that you can find it later and also put it as close to the data that you've actually acquired as possible. Does that answer the question? Agree to in a minute. So let's move here to Jared. Okay, uh -huh. so I, I noticed that another question i noticed that you dumped your environment and package versions do you have experience with conda uh, an environment management is it useful or, or a rabbit hole any caveats to sharing uh, with others and getting up and running uh so uh for me what i've seen with uh with conda and anaconda in general is that it is really my limited sense is that it's really creating a full software and execution environment for Python. So if I'm only going to be working with Python, that's great and that's very useful. Um, but oftentimes I'm not doing that. I'm actually going to be used compiling bi binaries mixture with Python. So what I choose to do is actually uh, run minimal Python where I've built up minimal Python environments with the virtual environment. What that does is uh, I find, for instance, give me a finer control of how that scientific, that software environment is being set up. So for instance, I've seen by using the tool LDD that sometimes um, when I load Anaconda, some of the libraries that it includes will actually be inserted uh, for use with my binaries, which are unrelated to Python. So for instance, if I remember correctly, that can happen with uh, OpenMP or MKL. So in particular, I try to go with just to make my life simple, the simplest and most minimal Python installation I might actually try to encode within my documentation how I actually set that up as well, so that hopefully it can be easily reproduced. 
question here. What is Bebop? Bebop is a tool here. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. So Bebop is a is a is a is a system that you can run on at Aragon. It's a cluster. Oh, I sorry. See. I should have specified that. Okay. So just I think we may have a few more minutes here. So let's see. Um, I'm going to allow participants to unmute themselves if they'd like to ask questions directly to to Jared. I think, Jared, that we have covered all that came in. There were some comments I'll paste in the chat later, but it's in, in the Google Doc. Any questions but, uh, for now? So let's see if there, there is a... George, you have one? Yes. Uh, yeah, nice, uh, nice presentation. Thank you. Do you have any thoughts on the usefulness of personal wikis as a knowledge management tool? I've seen this talked about in a few places as a, uh, a good way to handle you know, the nonlinear nature of how knowledge relates to other pieces of knowledge. I've never pers personally used a wiki, a wiki page for this sense. I do know a number of people who have used it and they seem to be quite happy about it. I think the reason I haven't used it is because many years ago when I was at the observatory, I was having a very similar conversation about how, which tools to use. And someone told me that they had tried to use wiki and they, they warned me against it. I think mm. in that particular case, and, and this was years ago, uh, so please remember that it was they were having a very hard time trying to find, you know, particular pieces of information that they had written in that wiki. Got so it. some of that is going to be, you know, maybe maybe the tools. I'm sure the tool has advanced. Maybe that's no longer an issue. But really, I think as with many of these toolings, there's you really can't anticipate what's going to be good and what's not going to be good. It really depends on the project. It really depends on the people as well and their challenges and the way they like to work. I think one thing I want to point out with this is I, I don't think I'm ever going to get settled down on any particular type of lab notes or lab notes, lab notes solution. I don't think I'm ever going to converge on to one type of these laboratory environments that's going to work on me, work for me. I think this is just a, an unending process. I think to some degree, I, I, I qualify some of this work as a craft. So I think some of it is just take a leap and see if you like it, learn what you Learn what you can from that situation. Does that answer your question, George? Yes, thank you. 